One form of ancient advanced astronomy that possibly came from the survivors of the Great Flood is found in the Nubian Desert. This is a site that is dated to the emergence of civilization after the last apocalyptic event on the Earth, and the question has to be, how did they possess advanced knowledge of astronomy at a time when we are told that human civilization was barely even conscious? And the answer could, of course, be the fact that this was the knowledge of an advanced civilization which survived in small numbers in this region 11,000 years ago before the eventual emergence of the dynastic period of Egyptian history. Wait till you hear this. First discovered in 1974, the civilization in which it emerged here is considered a lost civilization. But what if this was the survivors of Atlantis, for example, who eventually went on to claim the megastructures and all the glory of Egypt for their own after the deluge? It shouldn't be inconceivable for us to consider this to be a major piece of the jigsaw, but the fact is, we just don't know for sure. Of course, the evidence of the Great Flood is overwhelming, and so to the younger Dryas. But these obvious connections are still yet to receive worldwide recognition in an age that still accepts and teaches age-old ideas of the world that are heavily restricted. And anyone who disagrees with the theories that are force-fed to us are classed as pseudosciences. Nabata Playa is incredibly important and is widely overlooked in terms of a major historical site. It currently lies within a dry and unforgiving desert, but it was not always this way. Scientists have suggested that around 10,000 BC, a climate change occurred over North Africa caused by a northward shift of the summer monsoons. This change brought enough rainfall to the region to fill a number of dry lakes for at least several months of the year and thereby support life. This could be the result of the aftermath of the Younger Dryas event. Archaeological evidence appears to suggest that the first settlements of people in Nabata Playa arrived around 11,000 years ago, and the people who occupied the region at this time set up seasonal camps, moving on again when the water dried up. Eventually finding all the structures and riches of Egypt that survived the flood, an abandoned Egypt for these people must have been like stumbling into the gates of heaven. Hieroglyphs are not thought to have been present in Egypt at this time, so it is possible they knew of this place to some extent and began over millennia to inscribe the history of the Golden Period onto the great monoliths and pylons of this very ancient place. During this civilization's time at the ancient site of Nabata Playa, they constructed numerous megalithic monuments, including stone circles, underground tombs, huge stone slabs, and rows of stela, which extended over about 2,500 meters. The megalithic monuments are among some of the oldest in the world, predating Stonehenge by thousands of years. One of the most significant structures at Nabata Playa is a stone circle. Dating back at least 7,000 years, the stone circle is among the oldest of the Arco astronomical devices designed as a prehistoric calendar to mark two significant celestial phenomena. The summer solstice, which is associated with the onset of summer rains, and the arrangement of stars in the night sky, which they used to guide themselves across the desert. Was this the civilization who we now refer to as the dynastic Egyptians? Let us know below what you are thinking. This is just our theory, nothing else, nothing more. As always, guys, thank you for watching. <clears throat> the established view, you're looking at the plain of the Nile Valley in flood. It's a picture taken from an air balloon in 1872, when the Nile still, well, the Nile still floods, but when the flood actually reached Lower Egypt in the Cairo area, but since 1965, they built a dam, which blocks the natural flood. Apparently, the dam blocks 11 floods. God forbid if it ever breaks, because even one flood, a big flood, would cause havoc. And you're looking at, if you look at the top there, can you see it faintly? More to the left, there, more to the right there. Oh, I've got a pointer, I forgot. Somewhere there, right? See that? Is the plane, no? 
Well, look, it's on the top right, OK? <laughs> you can't see it. It has to be dark. Yeah, OK. Well, up there. Uh, is the plain of Giza and without pyramids. Uh, I've actually did a bit of, how do you call this, uh, photo, Photoshop stuff. So here is the story. And we're going to condense it in a matter of seconds. And you're going to move the three slides very fast. Can you go ahead? Because we're going to build the pyramids very quickly. <laughs> there it is. Well, Egyptologists have argued for years, you know, they were built in 20 years, in 10 years, in 50 years, and there's all these arguments, and they used 100,000 slaves, and now they say, no, they used 20,000, and the fact is that they built it. And uh, just by curiosity, how many of you have been to Egypt and so the pyramids? Quite, quite a few, huh? Well, for those who have, you know what I mean. It's, it's a hit. Uh, I've lived three years, the last, from 2005 to 2008. Uh, I've lived many years in Egypt, but I lived from 2005 to 2008, literally in front of the Great Pyramid. I had a flat overlooking the Great Pyramid. I saw it in the morning, in the evening, at breakfast, at lunchtime, uh, in the dark, with lights, in winter, in summer. I've had a belly full of the Great Pyramid. <laughs> and I can tell you that. You wake up in the morning, and you go there with your cup of coffee, and you think, it shouldn't be there. It's too big. <laughs> really. It's too, la it's, it's too perfect. It's, it's provocative. It, it's, 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 it's a giant question mark that looms there in front of you. And maybe that's what it is, like your crop circles. It's provoking us. It's the ultimate apple. Ask the questions. Who put it there? When? And the one that I got interested in is why? Why build this? And it stunned me that these fundamental questions of a monument of that size, and we'll talk about it in a minute, were not properly asked. It was all wrapped up in a nice consensus, the, you know, the, uh, some megalomaniac pharaohs. Where is uh, you, Newman? I was going to say megalithomania pharaohs, but build this. They wanted to build uh, giant tombs to impress their, uh, their population, and so they did. They mobilized the nation for dozens of years, and they built this tomb. Can we have the next one? Mm, there's a nice view of Giza uh, at night. It's, it's one of those things. There's a friend of mine who owns a, uh, a small guest house. Uh, literally, literally, the picture is taken from his balcony. If you ever go there, try and visit Gouda Fayed. He's a friend of ours. We go very often. He has this view all the time. And Gouda says, <laughs> he stopped looking at it because it's so damn provocative. You know, it's very funny with Egyptians around the pyramids. They, they stopped looking at it. Because you, you can't. You know, the answers don't come out, and eventually you ignore it. A bit like, I suppose, with crop circles. You know, when si suddenly scientists got bored with it, they think, no, no, no. It's easier to say it's just some nutcases doing it, and that's it. Because to ask the questions is so provocative. It's so provocative. I wasn't going to talk about crop circles, but uh, Francine showed a picture um, at the end of her talk. And I can tell you, I used to be a land surveyor and a building surveyor for many, many years. And if this was done overnight, there's no way. Now, I, I don't know who and what and how, but you can't do this. You can't set out, set out something like this. It'll take weeks, if not months. I used to set out buildings, hospitals, uh, airports, and I can tell you, we spent weeks and weeks and weeks doing this. So that alone needs an explanation. It demands an explanation. And it's left, you know, where are all the scientists working on this? It's quite amazing. Well, with the pyramids, there they were, Egyptologists, and you know, that's it, you know, their tombs, and bye-bye. Thank you very much. 
Well, the problem is this. This is the problem as far as I'm concerned. Can we move one slide? Is you're looking at an overhead view of the Great Pyramid. Now, I'm not going to go into all these statistics. You can put St. Paul's Cathedral and all this stuff in it. But let me give you just a few, because the scale of this monument is literally frightening. I was with a friend at uh, Stonehenge. Now, the ampler of Stonehenge, the actual circle, I don't know, I estimated about 30 meters. You know, the size of this, uh, a bit more than this room, right? Oh, maybe twice this room. This room is about 20 meters, right? The base, whoops, hello, the base of the pyramid, the base. Each side is 230 meters. You would put about, I don't know, 15 stone hinges next to each other. That's the size of this structure. It's 146 meters high, but that's not just its size that frightens and awes. It, it's precision. I usually like to give this uh, little analogy. I'm wearing, I bought this on a British Airways flight, my watch. It's a, one of these secondas you buy at 60 pounds. It's been a very, very good watch. It's worked for years. I've changed the batteries every four years and it's fine. And they tell me that it's accurate within five seconds a month. I'm happy. I mean, five seconds a month. I mean, I don't have any, any appointments that require that kind of accuracy. No, I'm, I'm happy with five seconds a month. But if I wanted this to be 100 thousands of a second, I'd pay millions and millions of pounds. I need an atomic watch to do that kind of precision. This is the difference between high precision and normal precision. In any industry, they know this. Well, this is a high precision pyramid. It's accurate to three arc minutes. That's the accuracy. It's 5% of a single degree. Let me give you an idea. You put a dartboard there, and you put me there, and you give me a dart, and you cover my eyes, and I shoot the dart, and I hit the bullseye. That's its accuracy. It's true. And they're supposed to have done this. Well, I'm not sure. According to the digitalists, they had nothing. They had brutal force and sticks. They didn't even have the wheel, no pulley, no iron tools. There is two and a half million blocks in this structure each weighing an average of two tons. And I'm not even mentioning the king's chamber that contains blocks weighing 60 to 70 tons a piece, brought from Aswan, they're granite blocks, and they've been moved to a height of 50 meters. It's quite incredible. Egyptologists are not stirred by this. Well, I can tell you, engineers, architects are puzzled. Are puzzled. <laughs>